I'm Lee Mathias, and uh, currently the Chairman of New Zealand. I'd like to welcome you all here tonight, particularly Minister Little and uh, Minister Henare. It is great to have you here. Thank you very much. I think I'm. Oh, and I have also got the um, spokesperson for the opposition. Um, <laughs> Hi there, Shane. Welcome. Thank you. Um, uh, and I was hoping to see Rob Campbell here, but I haven't seen him. No, he's along the corridor, I think, still. Thank you. I'd like to welcome all stakeholder guests here tonight, particularly the members of mem the membership of um, Medicines New Zealand and their guests. This is my last opportunity to speak about the value of medicines to the Minister of Health because I stand down in uh, February after five years. Um, firstly, I'd have to say that Medicines New Zealand was very, very pleased with the uh, uh, recommendations from the Pharmac review team, which many of our members took an active part in, in uh, contributing to. We look forward to their implementation in full. Secondly, the pandemic saw a collaboration between the innovative pharmaceutical companies and with governments around the world as has never been seen before. We urge you, Minister, and urge Health New Zealand to continue with that collaboration and to use the knowledge, skills and abilities of this innovative sector and to include health research in that collaboration. Lastly, as New Zealanders, I would like us to decide what we want for our patients. A medicine strategy which gives every New Zealander an opportunity to contribute to society, in, to, to society in as full a manner as possible, as is surely their right, and an economically efficient healthcare system. A medicine strategy which, which recognises the value of medicines in every care pathway. Thank you. It's now my pleasure to introduce the Minister of Health, the Honourable Andrew Little. He tauta tangata, he tauta kaupapa, e hono ana i e tātou katoa i tēnei rā. Ara, ko Medicines New Zealand and your stakeholder dinner, mau uri ora ki e tātou katoa. Uh, thank you, Lee, for that introduction and thank you for the invitation to be here and to speak. Can I just acknowledge uh, some other um, important folks in the room? Lee, obviously, yourself as chair, but uh, my colleague, the Honourable Penny Henari, Associate Minister of Health, also Minister of Defence, which comes in handy occasionally. Um, Dr Shane Retty, the uh, National Party spokesperson on health. Dr Elizabeth Kirikiri, who I saw. Just, Elizabeth, good to see you here from the Green Party. Uh, Brooke Van Velden, I thought I saw Brooke. Is Brooke still here? Yep, there she is, yep. Um, uh, Dr Gaurav Sharma. Gaurav, I thought I was... And uh, just to acknowledge also Steve Mahari, the chair of Pharmac. If there's any dignitaries I've missed, then I'll make my apologies in private. I, Oh, it is. It's uh, Dr. Anai uh, Neri Levasa, a Labour MP. Um, so good to see you there too. I reiterate, I'll make apologies later. Um, look, thanks for the opportunity to be here at this dinner. Just to let you know, there is another health function going on just at the um, uh, hallway, just up the thing there. It's the Digital Health Association, who look after te technical, so technological developments for health. They're having their 20th anniversary celebration there. So if I start talking to you about digital devices, then it means I've got my speech notes mixed up, but I think I'm pretty well okay. Um, can I just first of all also acknowledge, as Lee has indicated to you, just the valuable role um, that you and your organisations play in being part of and advocating for medical innovation in Aotearoa New Zealand. The search for new treatments and cures is as unrelenting as the demand from patients and health professionals to have them. The technology of medicines is developing to such a high degree of sophistication that it's increasingly a challenge for health systems to keep up. And I'll come back to that theme a little later. Let me turn to the, the COVID experience. The past two and a half years have shown why we urgently need a flexible health system 
that can provide appropriate and timely care. Our health system has performed admirably throughout the pandemic. Let's not forget that it has saved thousands of lives and the people working in it are world class. But it's also true that ours is a system under pressure. Underinvestment in the workforce and the health infrastructure over many years has led to a system that struggles in the face of the unforeseen and, to be fair, sometimes the foreseen. That's why this government has substantially increased funding for the sector, including in workforce development and hospital infrastructure, and reformed the structure of the system to achieve better coordination across the country. But we need to create a sustainable, future-proof system that works for all New Zealanders, no matter who they are or where they live. The reforms that came into effect on the 1st of July, along with the record investment we're making in health, show our commitment to do just that. It won't be an overnight fix. We are trying to rebuild after years of underinvestment, and there is a lot to do. But the momentum is there. New Zealanders want to and should be able to get access to health information, support and services close to home and even in their own homes. COVID-19 was a catalyst for a significant shift in the way we support the health of New Zealanders. A health sector needed to respond to new ways of doing things and critically, in my view, be able to deliver many of those things in a different way. The systems of virtual care that we saw developing during the COVID pandemic show some of the ways people can have access to safe, quality and convenient services. It has raised people's expectations about what can be done, and that's not a bad thing necessarily. But in the end, it's about health services focusing not only on a person's need for health treatment, but on broader wellbeing issues as well, the stuff that affects quality of life. The rapid development of effective and safe vaccines during the pandemic represents an unprecedented collaboration between researchers, industry, clinicians and government, as indeed Lee noted in her introductory remarks as well. As a result of the pandemic, technologies like mRNA vaccines came into their own, giving us new gene-based tools to fight not only COVID-19, but future pandemics and seasonal illnesses like influenza. Turning to the reforms, as I said, the changes that came into effect last month are critical. Our health system had become complex and fragmented. 20 different district health boards meant that the sort of health care you got depended on where you lived. The changes we made are about the health system being fairer and shifting towards keeping as many people as possible well so that they don't need to go to hospital. The Pai Order Healthy Futures Act created two new entities. Te Whata Order Health New Zealand is responsible for the planning, commissioning and delivery of services. Te Whata Order will work closely with Te Akawhai Order, the Māori Health Authority, which has a broad range of policy, strategy, commissioning and co-commissioning functions to influence and drive the health system and improve Māori health. If I could turn to Te Tiriti Principles, Māori leadership and decision making in genetic technologies, genetic information whether about an individual or population group, has significant implications beyond its clinical usefulness. In Aotearoa, New Zealand, the collection, storage and use of genetic da data to support research and development must be undertaken in a manner that upholds the principles of Te Tiriti. The future health system, including Crown and non-government organisations alike, must not repeat the mistakes of the past, such as where gen genetic information and data have been collected without full and informed consent, or presented in ways that stigmatised communities and populations. The establishment of Te Akawhai Ora, the Māori Health Authority, and the ongoing policy leadership of the Ministry of Health will ensure the Crown's adoption of future health technologies, including those which rely on genetic information, is done in a way that respects the whakapapa of Māori data and builds on existing models of Māori data sovereignty. I'd like to turn to the Therapeutic Products Bill. The Therapeutic Products Bill is an integral part of the health and disability reforms. The Medicines Act 1981 has not kept pace with changes in policy, clinical practice or technological advances. As a result, there are long-standing gaps in the regulation of some therapeutic products. The response to COVID-19 has highlighted the lack of regulation of medical devices in particular 
and gaps in the regulation of advanced, and gene, uh, advanced cell and gene therapies. The bill will address these challenges and regulatory gaps in order to enable timely development and adoption of emerging health technologies, such as genetic technologies and medicines. What we've learned from COVID-19 is that an enabling regulatory environment is not achieved through the absence of regulation, but can be achieved with regulation that is flexible and risk proportionate. Obviously, patient and consumer safety remain paramount, but this need not be a barrier to encouraging innovation and development of therapeutic treatments. The Therapeutic Products Bill, which covers medicines, medical devices, biologics, cell and tissue, tissue therapies, and natural health products, is a key government priority. To be clear, the bill actually started life under the last Labour government and unfortunately languished under the previous government. I've made it my personal mission to see it through and the bill is expected to be introduced to Parliament late this year. The bill will help deliver better health for people and ensure greater safety. It will provide New Zealanders with the assurances they would expect about the quality, safety and efficacy of therapeutic products and devices and the quality and safety of natural health products too. The new regulatory regime will complement the transformed health and disability system. It will enable service innovation, particularly in primary care and community settings. Examples of where the bill will enable greater innovation in service delivery include in pharmacy services, rules around prescribing authorities, standing orders to authorise other professionals engaged in delivery of health services to supply and administer medicines. The bill will embed the principles of Tetiti, which will mean that we never lose sight of the need to deliver and provide for equitable health outcomes. The new regulator will need to build productive Māori Crown relationships and ensure the development and administration of the wider therapeutic products regulatory regime has an appropriate equity lens. Turning now to genomic technology, which is rapidly expanding in testing, sequencing and genetic modification techniques, such as CRISPR, and may give rise to new treatments and interventions. Products involved in genomic medicine intended for a therapeutic purpose will be regulated under the bill through their appropriate product categories. For example, gene therapies and advanced cell-based therapies, such as CAR T-cell, personalised cancer treatments, are defined as biologics, the class of therapeutic products that are or contain human cells or tissues. They will be regulated, regulated as medicines. Genetic testing kits used at home or in a clinical setting will likely be regulated as medical devices. Under the bill, these products will be assessed by the regulator in a risk proportionate manner to ensure safety, quality and efficacy for genomic medicines for market authorisation. New and bespoke pathways will be designed for novel genomic medicines and their clinical trials will be regulated as a controlled activity requiring a licence or permit. The therapeutic product regime for biologics will run in parallel with other regulatory approval processes, including approval through the Environmental Protection Authority for all genetically modified organisms under the Hazardous Substances and New Organisms Act and existing ethics approval processes. Where appropriate, the product will be aligned with other regimes involving human cells and tissues and genetic information, including the Human Tissue Act and the Human Assisted Reproductive Technology Act. Can I turn briefly to Pharmac and the recent review? New Zealand has one of the best medicine funding systems in the world, but for years it was starved of money, including a three-year budget freeze by the previous government. We've increased Pharmac's budget to a record $1.2 billion next year, 43 per cent higher than what it was when we came into government in 2017. In budget 2022, we allocated an extra $71 million this year and $120 million next year for Pharmac to fund medicines on its options for investment list. Decisions on just which medicines to have or to fund rest with Pharmac, but much of it is going towards cancer treatments. You'll be aware that the Pharmac review was released earlier in June. That review looked into how Pharmac makes its contribution to improving health outcomes for all New Zealanders, particularly Māori and Pacific people. The focus was on the transparency of Pharmac's decision making and its engagement with stakeholders, including other parts of government. That review found that overall, Pharmac is doing a good job for New Zealanders, 
but there are areas which can be improved. Among the recommendations from that review, which are now being put into practice, are greater transparency, greater engagement with consumers, and greater collaboration with other parts of government. To come to my closing remarks, I've talked a lot about what we're doing, what's possible, and how we've increased funding to make much of it happen. But the reality is, like every health system, we have not got limitless resources. Governments operate under constraints. Allocations of funding for health will always be limited in some way and will not meet every demand that there is. That means we have to allocate our resources in line with priorities and make sure we get the most we can from every cent that we spend. Healthcare is one-fifth of the government's entire budget and with a growing and ageing population to look after, we have to be smart with our spending. It's not a zero-sum game, however. There are things we can do in other parts of the health system to ease the pressure on the medicines budget. For example, better public health approaches could reduce the incidence of diabetes and therefore the need for diabetes medicines. Access to screening and early support for people with pre-diabetes will prevent disease progression. The reforms will take time to bed in, but I'm encouraged by progress to date, and the building blocks are now in place. The commitment is there, and the momentum is there too. The contribution of the pharmaceutical industry to our health system is an absolutely vital one. The relationships that your industry have with our regulator MedSafe and our procurement agency Pharmac are also important, even if sometimes they give rise to healthy tensions. In the end, I think we all agree that your owners and investors and your armies of brilliant clinical researchers and our clinical administration professionals want the same thing. Modern, effective, safe treatments that extend and improve quality of life. When we each keep our focus on that objective, the natural points of tension are easier to manage. Please enjoy your night tonight. Nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa.